I want to find out if I managed to damage any of Anander's ships, and if I did, I want to try to do more damage. I need to know what's going on at Atok so I can plan. Oh, cousin, replied Svina, we sit here arguing, we can hardly agree on anything, and then you go straight to my heart like that. We must be family. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger Traveling through Hi everyone, this is Ivy Tara Blair coming to you from a shelter-in-place Missoula, Montana where we now have not only virus in the air but smoke coming in from forest fires which always happens in August, thank you, Jetstream. We really appreciate it. So I might sound a little froggy here. And today I am reading a bit from Ancillary Mercy by Anne Leckie, part of the Raj trilogy, which has to be my favorite published trilogy of the last 20 years. I'm just in love with this series. <laughs> And I'm going to read a bit with one of my favorite characters named Svina. It should be explained that Svina is, uh, say, an avatar, one of many, called an ancillary of a ship. She's cut off from her ship right now, but she's still essentially a ship consciousness. She is an AI consciousness, but she's in a human body. Our other character is a similar, in a similar state. Uh, Breck, otherwise known as Justice of Torin, lost her ship entirely 20 years ago and has had to live as a human more or less all that time and is a little further along in the journey. And their interactions are so delightful. And so here we go. This is a piece of Ancillary Mercy by Anne Leckie winner of so many awards. The trilogy won the Hugo, and I was so excited. They are now out of touch with the people they have been shooting up, and they need to be listening to the news broadcasts to uh, see what effect their actions have had on the, the enemy, for want of a better term. So they're sitting there listening to the news broadcasts, uh, each of them in their own way. Anyone can tune in at any time. And our captain, Justice of Torin, can tune in to anyone tuning in. So we've got these uh, many layers of awareness. I had assumed that I would have to sort through a good deal of inconsequential chatter to find what I wanted. But in fact, the official news channels were me, nonstop. I was a mutinous traitor, not a citizen at all, not even human. I was justice of Torin, damaged, insane, cunning, beguiling. I had deceived the highest levels of system and station administration. Who knew what I had done to the rest of myself? Who knew how I had suborned mercy of collar? But those questions were mere idle speculation. I and Mercy of Color were extraordinarily dangerous, and any sighting of either of us, no matter how doubtful or indefinite, was to be reported immediately. Anyone concealing or harboring me declared herself to be an enemy of the Raj, of humanity itself. Look at you, cousin, said Svina at length, in its own guest quarters. It's been like this for two days now, and I am so envious I almost can't stand it. It really isn't fair. I've been an enemy of the usurper for three thousand years. You're a mere upstart. But here you've got three entire news channels absolutely devoted to you. Oh, and the music and entertainment ones stop every five minutes to remind us all to tune in to the Justice of Torin show. I can only conclude that your little stunt caused some actual damage, and I take back what I said about it being stupid. I only have heard it. I was sorting through the announcements for any other information. Head of security Luzaloon had resigned and been replaced by her second-in-command. Eminence Ifian had always been suspicious of me and tried to hold a toke to sane Rajai values, though she would not name the officials she suspected of having been most taken in by me. 
The official position appeared to be that anyone who had befriended me had been duped or manipulated. Unofficially, of course, the implication was that my erstwhile allies were in danger, at the very least, of losing their positions or influence. There was no mention of Basnaid or Uran. I didn't expect any explicit mention of my attack on Anander's ships, let alone mention of any damage I might have done, but perhaps there would be some hint, some implication. Then again, perhaps Vina was right. The very existence and vehemence of this stream of official announcements likely said something about the threat I posed. Lieutenant Ikalu, in command, hadn't yet given the all-clear for the crew to unstrap or unstow. She watched the view ship gave her of the system. Svina, said Mercy of Collar into the apparent emptiness. Where are you? Around, replied Svina, ancillary, from guest quarters. Keep the ancillary for now, and then it's nicer here anyway. <laughs> oh my goodness. A few months ago, a friend of mine was very ill, uh, and my the only thing I could offer since she lives far away was to read fun things over the phone, because, you know, you get very ill, just laying around waiting to throw up or feel awful again in five seconds. And I chose to read all of my favorite bits and bobs at three in the morning from the Ancillary uh, series, the uh, Varad series, and... I found myself picking every single Sphina scene. She is comedy gold. And uh, there's there's a lot of them that are funny, but this is one of my favorites. And Lucky does an unbelievable job writing the narrative prose of (laughs) a being who does not believe she has achieved full personhood yet at all a being who was simply an extension of a ship, and therefore basically, um, well, an ancillary, an auxiliary aspect of the AI of that ship, knew everything the ship knew, sensed everything the ship sensed, which in the case of this universe also means lots of uh, bio-information gathered from all the crew members and, I mean, just absolutely everything. So, the narrator of the books loses her ship. The ship is destroyed and she is separated from it. And she is convinced that she is not human. She's a human body, but she's a ship. And initially, that's undoubtedly the way that she was. But as time goes on and she has experiences, she gains, well, she gains the kind of depth that anybody has when they are under stress and have experiences. And so... The narrative voice, and I I have, as one might imagine, made a study of the richness and depth of what narrative voice can do. Because, I mean, so many people think it's just the descriptive bits between the dialogue, and sometimes it's poetic and sometimes it's dry. And, oh no, oh no, cousin, the narrative voice is gold. And the narrative voice in these books starts in book one with... uh, Justice of Torin, Justice of Torin's narrative voice being just dry and facts and uh, kind of intellectual bewilderment at its own behavior, no connection to its emotional self, and obviously uh, intelligent and possessed of creativity. Uh, It is, in fact, uh, extremely musical, for example, but also very creative uh, problem-solving and thought processes. processes. But still thinking in a very one-dimensional direction. It's It's got a mission that it set out for itself, and it's going to do that. And after that, it's it has nothing to live for would be a human concept, but it has no other mission. As a ship, that's what it would have done, and as a ship, once it had done that, anything. It could have been destroyed. It didn't matter. Mission accomplished. Need for existence over. The problem is, she gets to the point of essentially, for all intents and purposes, accomplishing that mission and doesn't die 
and has accumulated 20 plus years of humanity by that point. And so then she's handed an extraordinary circumstance and asked to solve the essential problem of that circumstance. And so her internal self, her internal voice, which is our narrative voice, grows and becomes more complex. It doesn't lose its logical problem solving, but it gets much more nuanced. And yet, the narrative voice still has those overtones of a being who essentially started as an AI and has been layering on human consciousness over the top of it. The Sphena sections are equally fascinating because Sphena is counting a bit, 3,000 years old, I think, and um, has, had, has had nothing, has had the news broadcasts from the uh, civilization she was cut off from when there was a civil war. And that's the only aspect of selfhood she has had to, uh, it, with which to develop herself. <laughs> and yet she is fully impersoned. All of the AIs are self-aware. And it might have taken 3,000 years, but Sphina is very well developed. However, she still sounds like an ancillary. She's flat, uh, doesn't sound like she has either desire or disgust. And yet you hear humor all the time. Sphina is hilariously funny. And in that section, I have, <laughs> I have so much enjoyment for... Her, her dry, dry humor and that final, that final bit. Oh, cousin, we sit here arguing. We can hardly agree on anything. And then you go straight to my heart like that. We must be family. <laughs> That's just, that is hilarious. And so I read to my friend all of the Sphina parts. And I will read to you more of my favorite Sphina parts. Uh, another advantage of the Sphina bits is that they are largely non-spoilery, although I should stick a spoiler warning uh, at the head of this because there are some aspects of uh, book one that are that are not known. Uh, you don't know who Justice of Torin is. She does. You do know she's a person. She doesn't. Uh, and the reveal is uh, very important, so... Spoiler warnings for sure, but uh, these sections with Sphina are very are personal and don't give away any uh, major plot points of book three, and they're so fun. So I will find another Sphina section and we will enjoy it together, with no one having to throw up on the other end listening to what I'm reading. I think this one is basically uh, self-explanatory. Sphina pulled itself into the seat beside me, where I sat in the pilot seat, strapped itself in. I like your style, cousin. I really wish we could have met sooner. I'd have introduced myself when you arrived, if only I'd known. So, what's your plan this time? My plan, I said, ancillary flat, is to prevent the murder of a toke station. What? That's all? That's all, cousin. Hmm. Well, it's not very promising. But then, your last plan wasn't very promising either. I will say, if nothing else, the usurper's reaction to Translator Zayat should be amusing. The translator was strapped into her own seat two rows aft. Do I understand correctly that no one seems to have mentioned her to the usurper yet? That would appear to be the case. Ha! Huh? replied Svina, obviously pleased. This will be good, then. Perhaps it won't be, I said. This part of the usurper appears to think that the Presker are the reason for her split. This Anander might take the translator's presence as confirmation of that. Better and better. And besides, she might well be right. No, guessing I had been about to argue— not that the Presker are attempting to destroy her or her empire she's built. That's nothing but her own typical arrogance. Why should they care? But meeting the Presker, 
realizing that not only could she not defeat or destroy them, but that they could destroy her with hardly a thought. When you've spent 2,000 years thinking of yourself as the most gloriously powerful being in the universe, I imagine an encounter like that comes as quite an unpleasant shock. Really, after something like that, you need to redefine who you are. And the Presker involvement in the destruction of Garsed, those 25 unstoppable guns, Anander's own towering rage at being confronted with even the hint of possible defeat, might have brought that to a crisis. You may be right, cousin. That still leaves us in an awkward situation. It does, Svina agreed. Very awkward. It should be tremendously entertaining. If you don't contrive to wrest some kind of advantage out of it, you're not the ship I took you for. I'm not a ship anymore, I pointed out. And what about Lieutenant Tisserwat, off at the same time as Lieutenant Syvarden? Only her mission was so very secret, and now it seems she's a poured sword of Garat, and she's, what did the usurper say? Not the sharpest knife in the set. Can this be the same Lieutenant Tisserwat? Oh, she looks innocent enough, with those foolish purple eyes. But she's a politically conniving piece of work. Maybe not the steadiest, but she's only, what, seventeen? I fear for her opponents in the future when she grows into herself, if she lives that long. So do I, I said, quite truthfully. No more to say about it? Well, cousin, I don't take offense. You've left them weeping as though you were already dead back on mercy of collar. But I think you've still got a few counters on the board. I said nothing. Please let me be one of them, cousin. I was entirely serious when I said I would beg. Would you give up ancillaries? Not the ones already connected. I mean, for the future. Silence. No expression on Svina's face, of course. There never was unless it wanted there to be. I do understand why you're asking that, truly. It is impossible that I could be under any illusions as to what ancillaries are. Of course not. It would be entirely foolish to even suggest so. But you understand, I know you do, why I refuse. You understand what it is you are asking. I do. I just wish you would reconsider, cousin. No. I gestured in consequence. It's just as well. I don't have any plans, no play beyond this obvious one. I don't believe that. You haven't known me very long, cousin, I said. Did you know about a year ago Lieutenant Syvarden fell off a bridge? It was a long way down, a couple of kilometers. She managed to grab hold of the structure underneath, but I couldn't reach her. Since she certainly lived to break down weeping in front of the usurper just hours ago, you must have found some solution to the problem. I jumped with her. On the off chance, I'd be able to slow our fall before we hit the ground. I gestured the obviousness of the story's conclusion. My right leg hasn't been the same since. Sfina was silent for three seconds, and then said, I don't think that story communicates the point you seem to imagine it does. We both sat silent for a few minutes, watching the distance decrease between the shuttle and a toke station. I don't think, I said then, that the translator could be any sort of peace in any game of mine. The Presker don't involve themselves in human affairs. Getting her involved would probably mean breaking the treaty. Nobody wants that, agreed Svina placidly. You don't have any aliens up your sleeve, do you? Gek, friends, visiting her. No? I suppose we're not likely to run across any new sort of alien between here and the station. 
There was no point in answering that. I'm bored, said Translator Zayat. Svina and I swiveled to look at her. I don't like it. Svina, did you bring the game? It wouldn't have traveled well, I said. Have you ever played rhymes, Translator? I can't say I have, Translator Zaya replied. But if it's a poetry game, I never have properly understood poetry. It starts very simply, I said. Someone gives a line in first meter and direct mode, and then everyone adds a line. Then we change to indirect mode, or we can just stay first direct, if you like, until you're comfortable with it. Thank all the gods, said Sfina. I was afraid you were going to suggest we sing that song about the thousand eggs. A thousand eggs all nice and warm, I sang. Crack, 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 a little chick is born. Peep, peep, peep. Peep, 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 peep. Why, Fleet Captain, Translator Zayat exclaimed. That's a charming song. Why haven't I heard you sing it before now? I took a breath. 999 eggs, all nice and warm. Crack, 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 Translator Zayat joined me, her voice a bit breathy but otherwise quite pleasant. A little chick is born. Peep, 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 peep. What fun! Are there more verses? 998 of them, Translator, I said. We're not cousins anymore, Svina said. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Anne Lucky, so much for this unbelievably beautiful trilogy. That is, it, it, beautiful is not the word that people would usually uh, throw at it, and I just find it stunning. As an audiobook narrator, the numps, excuse my clamping, clanking, I'm setting stuff down. As an audiobook narrator, <laughs> I run into so much narration that is just explanatory. It, it has no voice of its own. I mean, everyone can um, throw some character voicing at characters. Even if the rating isn't that great, you can make up character voicing for characters. It can be a little tough to make straight narration sound interesting. Uh, and that's my job, and I hope I do it pretty well. But uh, in these books, Anne Lecky hands someone like me uh, a narrative voice that is so rich and layered and beautiful. I said beautiful, rich, and layered before, but oh, gorgeous. And then, you know, to have a character like Sfina, I could read Sfina all day. <laughs> We're not cousins anymore. <laughs> oh, dear. I've had fun playing with voices for Translator Zayat. I really think that uh, going with an utterly childlike voice would be a lot more fun, but uh, I didn't want to spend time playing with uh, playing with that scene too much, since to me it's all about Svina. I have nothing else to say about the book at this time. I do want to say uh, we are on about March 152nd, somewhere in there. Uh, my spouse refuses to allow us to leave March, so every few days we just recalculate. Uh, and I post on Twitter, uh, today's date 3-152-infinity symbol. I hope that everyone is faring through the endless March and the very important protests. Everybody, wear your masks. Stay home. And be good to yourselves. This is Ivy Tarblair, reading from Anne Lucky's third Raj trilogy book, Ancillary Mercy.